For this session, we're talking about uh, really when you get those 3 a.m. phone calls, uh, managing life cycles in the global 24-7, 365 uh, media machine. Uh, you know, and I can say as a, as a former broadcast operator and uh, manager, you know, nothing ever happens at 2 in the morning, or I'm um, 2 in the afternoon. It's always on a Sunday at 3 in the morning. Um, you know, and so I look to my, uh, my colleague over here, Jim, and I'm going to ask that question, why? You know, is there, is, is there that button that um, actually uh, goes off, you know, to uh, wake up everybody in that? So on our panel, um, we've got uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Asciutto, Senior VP of Technology and Engineering at Showtime. Uh, next to him, I have to look, is, uh, <laughs> and, and I mess his name up. Yeah, the hard last name that I mess up all the time is Luke, as they say, uh, Peter Nostro, who's the Director of Lifecycle Services for uh, us here at Globecom. And then on the end is the uh, Senior Vice President of Technology at Fubiquity, uh, Mr. Jeremy Morrison. So thank you, gentlemen, first for uh, coming on board and uh, giving us your expert opinions, advice, and commentary um, on this, uh, on this uh, what can be a very interesting topic, let's say. But I, you know, if we can just go down the road first off, uh, you know, kind of tell us your background. Um, we know about you, but that's okay. <laughs> for the record. For the record. Yeah, this is for the record and for the, for the streaming audience. But, you know, your background, uh, you know, your, the, the area of ex expertise as it brings to this, you know, and a little about the company you represent. Sure. Uh, so Showtime, as, as you guys probably know, is a, a premium uh, uh, program provider to the cable and satellite and telco industry. Um, we have, I think, approximately 46 feeds that are sent out of this facility. This is our network operations center in the back, and I don't know if you had given tours at all uh, today. Uh, but our operations center is in the back over here, so we have, um, you know, 46 linear feeds in MPEG-2 and MPEG-4, standard def and high def, to satisfy everybody's needs. Um, myself, uh, I'm responsible for the engineering technology, which includes this facility, our uh, advanced technologies, which are the streaming uh, and AVOD content, both uh, for conventional um, MVPD distribution and internet distribution. So it's kind of a big, it's a big area. It's, it's really focused on the distribution technologies. Um, so if you look at satellite, you look at internet, and you know, any other technologies that we're uh, investigating. Uh, I've been with the company now the next year, I think it's 20 years. And prior to that, um, uh, God, I don't remember back that long. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, so in, in various capacities over here. So. Uh, but focus mainly on the technology and network uh, uh, network operations center. So, but um, as we go on, you'll, you'll I'll share some of the uh, some of the experiences we have as we roll out new platforms and repurpose media for those platforms and how we deviate from what we'll call the conventional broadcast mentality in monitoring. Uh, you know, it's it's been a learning experience for us and. There's certainly a lot of holes in the, uh, what we'll call the technology, and a lot of retraining of the people, so. Thank you. Luke? Uh, Luke Padanastro, Director of Lifecycle Services. Um, pretty, much every, pretty much everything that happens in the field uh, I'm responsible for. Um, I've been with Globecom now for about 15 years. Uh, before that, of course, uh, Globecom's predecessor, Satellite Transmission Systems and before that a uh, stint over at uh, Harris Government Support Systems Division. Um, basically what I'm responsible for here is everything from any kind of preventative, corrective, or emergency maintenance for all the various networks that we uh, manage here. Um, and it could be, uh, it, it, sometimes it gets very diverse, you know. Um, it can be a, a retail outlet, a, a bank branch, a gas station, or it could be on a mountaintop in the middle of Cascade, Idaho. So um, we have a real diverse uh, set of customers, and we have a, and of course they have a, a real diverse set of uh, sites that we're responsible for. Um, my team manages the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, tasks associated with those sites. So um, 
we, we do everything from preventative maintenance to corrective maintenance to emergency maintenance. So as O'Brien said, some of those calls at 2 o'clock in the morning are my cell phone, and they're saying, Luke, the site is down. You better get somebody there right away. So um, that's kind of what I do here. And um, uh, I, I t well, we'll talk a little bit more about the, uh, those 2 o'clock in the morning calls and how we handle them and uh, some of the ways that you can mitigate that as, as time goes on. And, and that really, from the design of the network to the... Um, to the, to, to the, and that's where it really starts, is in the design of the network, and then maintaining afterwards. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Morrison, uh, spent about 12 years working at a, a preeminent satellite communications company in Long Island, this one, um, and, until about eight years ago when I, I left and joined a company that's uh, known as Ubiquity. We've gone through a couple of different name changes. Uh, some people know us as Aurora's or Avail TVN or TVN Entertainment or uh, the On Demand group that was out of the UK. Uh, a number of those different companies have now been rolled up into what is Ubiquity. And we are a, a we provide content media services uh, to programmers, to MVPDs, and content distribution services. So um, we do that on the linear side. Uh, part of our business is receiving content from about, we pull in about 450 linear feeds into our main uh, Burbank Superhead End from, from a number of different programmers. We format that content into uh, MPEG-4 and then we distribute that content via satellite and via our 10 gig fiber network to MVPDs around the country and, and into the Caribbean. We're also more and more taking that content and distributing it into or, or encoding that content into multi-bit rate format and distributing those linear feeds in multi-bit rate to MVPDs as well. Um, that's probably about 10% of our business is the linear distribution. Uh, pr the predominant part of our business is VOD distribution. So we, we also take VOD content in from multiple programmers uh, all around the world. We format it, we, we do QC on it, we format it, we acquire it into our system, and then depending on the specific needs of the affiliates, we either directly might distribute it back out to them in cable lab specs to go into their distribution platform, we might turn it into MPEG-4, and more and more we are becoming a content factory. So we will store the content on their behalf, put it into all sorts of unique formats, um, apply multiple DRM, t well, transmux it into multiple packages for them for streaming into smooth streaming or Dash or H uh, Flash, uh, put all sorts of different DRM into it, and then depending on the environment, either directly distribute and publish it into their origin servers, into their CDN, or now we're, we're starting to launch and, and provide hosted origin services, services as well. So um, I, I think the difference, uh, you know, where our company comes in into this, into the maintenance and operations play is really, uh, we, we start from the highest level and saying, don't have an operation center. Don't, don't do your own transcoding. Don't do your own receipt of content. Outsource all of that to us so that you won't get any of those phone calls because we're just that one throat to choke. So, but we'll, we'll get into more of that. Keyword, outsourcing. Yes. So thank you. <laughs> now, so let's let's just open it up. I, you know, I've got some questions. Um, you know, we all have gotten those calls, and and I'm sure a lot a lot of you out there have have gotten them as well, in in one form of fashion. It, it as I used to say, it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when, and that's why you have to be prepared not only once, twice, but uh, three times. You know, so backup is is I think a, a critical part of this. But uh, let me just ask Jim. You know, with these systems becoming more complex uh, from origination, distribution, and even, you know, out at the end user level, how do you accomplish, you know, to have an overview of everything at once? And reliability is, you know, what we're talking here, and efficiency, but also the efficiency of that monitoring, or if it's a said monitoring system, you know, how, how do you tackle that? No, that's a, it's a great question because, you know, as I said before, is, there's a good amount of retraining that we're going through um, as we enter into, you know, some of the new worlds of delivering video to iPads and devices, not Blackberries, but um, Android, um, you know, desktop PCs, tablets. Um, it's a different mindset on how you monitor and also what, where are you going to monitor in the, in the uh, distribution chain. Coming from the broadcast side, where we've really focused on, 
we were able to always look at our master control uh, or operation center here, look at different uh, key spots in the chain, monitor, you know, look at the video, look at the audio. You had tools that you could analyze. Uh, you knew if you were having problems. Um, you know, we have some, some good tools there that alert us if, even if there's things going on that we don't see. Um, and the confidence was your SAT return. You know, it's always nice. The operator could sit there, look at his outbounds, preview his program, uh, control him out, and look at your SAT return and say, everything looks good, so I'm, I'm, I'm fine. When you start going into advanced, uh, advanced devices like this, the monitoring really becomes a challenge. Um, we're seeing it now as we, you know, as we roll out our Showtime Anytime product more and more. Um, you know, we have to make it down to the consumer level. Whereas previous in the broadcast side, we had to make it to the MVPD. Up to there, once, once they got the signal, it was in their network, they had responsibility. The, the um, you know, in the internet world, we're delivering down to a specific device, or we're delivering it to the MVPD that ultimately, you know, they'll take responsibility, um, you know, if it's on their network. But, you know, if we're gonna deliver to this device that's gonna be sitting in a consumer's uh, home, and it's our product, our Showtime Anytime product, we need to be able to make sure that they're gonna be able to get a, a good quality of service. So there's all sorts of, um, I don't wanna say tricks, but there's all sorts of um, back reporting techniques that we use, you know, you can put beacons in your client that report back to your uh, servers to see if there's network issues going on. Um, you can put probes at different point in your distribution uh, there's a couple of vendors out there that, you know, we're discussing with that make some excellent products. Um, but it's, again, it's, it's a different mindset. You know, you, when, you, when you have so many feeds and so many endpoints to manage, you're, you're not looking at the video saying, oh, everything's okay. You almost look, you're doing the opposite. You're managing by exception and looking for where you go out of tolerance under certain, uh, certain conditions. Um, so... You know, when you think about it, if, uh, if you have Showtime, Showtime Anytime, and you're sending out a feed of Showtime to multiple devices, you got Android, um, desktop, Xbox, you know, you name the device, generally you're going to have different formats for those devices, you know, whether it's smooth streaming with PlayReady, DRM, um, you know, Widevine we're using, uh, Zuki we use, you know, we use a couple of different technologies in in the distribution. That, so each of those technologies are separate, you know, separate feeds. Um, and, and this is aside from the VOD content, which is a different animal. Then you have multiple bit rates inside of those, you know, on, on top of those feeds. You might have nine different bit rates, maybe more. So by the time you get done, you know, you could have 50 different streams that you're, you know, you have to make sure are going okay. And that's for one service. Now, you know, you got an east feed, a west feed, multiple linear channels, you know, you, you have hundreds of feeds. You're not going to have somebody sitting behind looking at video and saying, oh, everything's fine. It just, that's not going to work. So that, that's why we're kind of taking a different approach, monitoring by exception, set up using some of, some of the more conventional IT type products that are out there, and also some of the, you know, some of the other products that are really e evolving to serve this industry, um, you know, the internet video. Um, it, it's a challenge, you know, there's, there's no question about it. You, we're, we're used to a certain quality of, uh, quality of service with satellite, and we don't see that here. You know, we don't see that on the internet. We see much lower quality of service. Any kind of thing, you know, little hiccups in the ISP, in, in you know, whoever your local uh, ISP is, affect your product that you don't necessarily have any control over. So it looks good coming out of the CDN, but by the time it reaches the home, no, it's not, not so good. Um, so how do you deal with that? You know, how do, how do you mitigate those problems? Um, so, you know, as, as time goes on, we're making calls to the different ISPs saying, hey, did you have a problem last night at 8 o'clock? Because all of a sudden, all of our feeds dropped. So, so it's, uh, it's a learning experience. And, uh, you know, I can, I can say that, you know, we're in the process of doing it, and we've stumbled a lot and we found solutions for a lot of um, you know a lot of the issues thanks yeah you know it's those stumbles that really 
to help you learn from your past experiences so you don't take it again. But, you know, still with these more, and, and let me toss this to uh, Jeremy, um, that, you know, with these, these systems getting so complex, and like your super knock, you know, out, out west, you've got, you know, feeds coming in from every imaginable digital source, and still, you know, there's, there's a lot of programmers out there and distributors that receive, you know, content still in the analog world. So basing that, you know, is there a, a one solution answer, do you feel? And if so, you know, can you elaborate that on? Uh, but then more importantly, you know, do, where do we see this stepping up? You know, in, you know, if you take a look at the crystal ball, you know, what are we going to do to make this simpler? You know, with the, you know, with ABR coming on board, you know, anytime, anywhere, you know, and like what Jim was saying, you know, have beacons out there for reply back, so you have actually in-field sensing, you know. But the true, you know, in in the former operations of you know one person sitting in front of seven monitors, you know, for confidence monitoring, it's more the exceptional based monitoring, you know, where you're literally doing more with less because you don't have you know, as much budget for employees, but you still have to man the equipment for that efficiency. So if you could, you know, just comment on that, that'd be great. First, I want to um, comment a bit about the way that we do monitoring on our VOD, because that, that's an awful lot of the content that flows through the building. Sure. And, and has, has, you know, we've got about 25,000 VOD assets that come through the building. So, and, and in that environment, we're getting, each one of those assets is going through multiple transformations, getting into very likely an, an inter, Coming in whatever format we get it, some of it's still on tape, very little these days, uh, but ProRes and high, high, high bitrate MPEG-2 and high bitrate MPEG-4, whatever the form might, might be, we have to move that into an intermediate MES file and then into a number of different formats depending on the different affiliates that we're sending content to. So we, we've had to design that monitoring environment such that every single piece of asset at every, transform, uh, every step of transformation goes through an automated QA process. So we've got Sencore and we've got Paton systems that are looking for different, different types of errors in, in the files themselves. And then we, we've spent a lot of time working through what are effective sampling rates for us to do manual QC as well. We, we do five-point manual Q, QC and we start, you know, and, and we're still, I would say a lot of work is still going into looking at what is the correct sampling rate at each one of those different steps. And then depending on the, you know, do you QC for example, take one file every once in a while and look at every single variant that's come out of it. Do you just keep looking at different variants across those different profiles as you're creating them? Where, where do you monitor through within that system? And then we, we add on to that the complexity, uh, which a lot of people who are service providers and not the end content provider, we've got different SLAs to different environments as well. So we've got to build a, a smart enough management system that can cr um, create the work order tickets for us to do that monitoring to meet those different SLA requirements for each one of those different customers. So that's, that, that's been a, a, a fun exploration into how to enhance our monitoring for quality of service for those areas. On the, on the linear distribution side, uh, today the, the majority of the way we're distributing it is via multicast. So we, we have a pretty intense uh, IndioQuest monitoring system at our facility. We monitor, um, all of our feeds come in digitally. So um, take it all in, go, go ASI, encapsulate it, go through transcoders, and then uh, distribute out. We, we, so a, a core IndioQuest system looking at all of the, our feeds in and out, and then we have probes spread throughout uh, at all of our POPs. Uh, we have a, a fiber ring throughout the country, so there's, there's IndioQuest monitoring each one of the POPs, and then probes that are out at core customer sites monitoring the feeds again at those points. And as well, we have a kind of a, a feed control manager, we call it, but a, a device that all of our feeds go through that monitors not the video signal, um, but, the, but the stream itself, looking for errors, as well as the routers that are in place looking for CRC errors. So our, we certainly haven't found that magic bullet of this is that one system uh, that, that encompasses everything. We, we've been moving to Zerion as a, as, a, as a core monitoring system that then is pulling in alerts from Nagios that we've got on different PCs or what, whatever the different monitoring systems are that at least consolidates the trouble tickets into one environment, but it's, it's certainly not one monitoring system that we've got that can look across the board at everything. All right, thanks. Yeah, it, yeah you know, so I, I think we've kind of nailed it on the head here. You know, even though these systems are, are becoming complex, is there a one-step, one-solution device, you know, and, 
And years ago, we would say, oh, WUG, you know, what's up gold? Um, you know, we, we use that here on, on a lot of our stuff. That was, you know, the end all be all. But uh, that's not the case now, you know, with all of this complex technology combined with the ability to view said, you know, uh, distribute or content anytime, anywhere, makes this a very difficult and challenging time for everybody, including the fact, you know, like, a, like I was talking about earlier, you know, you want to reduce that op cost, you know, for your FTE or your, you know, your employee budget, you know, because to have, you know, one person sitting there at one fee, does that make a lot of sense? You know, from, from a manager of the operations, yeah, it makes perfect sense. You know, but from the other side, does it? And, and then it's really important to look not just at, you know, is that system up, but what are those processing rules of what's got to happen each one of those steps, and, and how are you getting the monitoring back in? For, for example, we take assets and distribute them to affiliates, but they've they mm -hmm. got to go into their asset management system. They've got to be published in that environment. They've got to be spread out potentially to 30 or 50 different VOD systems spread throughout the country. Then they've got to be made available to the asset, uh, right. to, to the subscriber, and then they've you know, potentially used to be real easy. You sent a VOD asset, it went into their VOD system, it, it got available. Now you go into a, an asset management system that does further transcodes into different environments, and a single affiliate might have 50 different distribution systems out to their affiliates. So you, you know, we're trying to look at then, not, not just the monitoring of is it up and is it available and, and are, are our distribution systems in place, but then are our customers' distribution systems in place and have each one of those assets flown through and been made available so that when Jim says to us, hey, these Showtime assets you distributed, not have you distributed them to the MVPD, but are they available to the subscribers throughout their whole system, that we've got to take that reporting back in from across the board and tabulate that and have that kind of reporting available. So it's th the complexity of the reporting also is continuing to grow, not, not just in terms of uptime, but, but whole end-to-end -end distribution of where the content is sitting. It's not only, the, not only the management of the set operation, but also the data acquisition of, for your uptime efficiency, reliability as well, which is complex in its own right uh, for the data reporting side. Well, let's take it to the field now. So Luke, we, you know, with field services, how do you manage um, such a, I, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's like studying weather. You know, you can't really put your finger on it, but you know when you, you know when when you uh, when you get that call, uh, you've got to you've got to quickly react for the customer. Well, you know, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, certainly, the technology is uh, so changing rapidly, and having the right people with the right skill sets at the right place at the right time is really always been the challenge. But uh, the way things are happening now at such a fast pace, it's making it even more and more difficult. So, um, you know, you have to have some intelligence back at the home office so that essentially what happens is sometimes you have a set of hands in the field who's being guided directly by somebody back at the NOC or the TOC or, or level three support. Mm -hmm. And um, we do that a lot here because we understand that, you know, uh, a lot of these guys can't be experts in everything, you know. Um, and, well, plus we have a pretty diverse uh, set of customers here, anybody from a video customer to a voice customer to... Uh, so you really have to have experts back at home base who can, you know... Of course, there's, a, you know, training and things like that that you do. One of the ways that we do it here is when we're rolling out a new network is we have the teams come in here for training on exactly how, this, uh, how the equipment operates. They will be the experts um, going and doing the implementation out in the field, but we'll have our local folks now meet up with that implementation team, and they'll be trained directly by the experts who are installing it. So it gives you a certain level of um, confidence that they're going to be able to get out there and know what they're doing, but there, like I said, there's just too much to know about everything, and, uh, and that's really the challenge. You know? So there's some innovative ways that you can you know, train these folks, right? We've got our tempo learning platform, and, I've actually, um, uh, just a quick story, I had to, we had a, we do disaster recovery for the uh, FAA, and uh, one of their sites went down, and we had to quickly deploy a, uh, one of our field terminals here. So uh, the equipment was already on its way, the technicians been lined up, and the, the technician called me and said, Luke, you know, I've never installed one of these before, is it difficult? They said, no, it's a piece of cake, don't worry about it. And uh, of course, I was lying, but um, I said, here's what we're going to do. I said, um, it was too late to get like an actual video presentation to them, a DVD or anything like that. 
So what we did is we put the uh, video up on tempo, and I said, here, I sent them a link. I said, go ahead and log on, watch this video, and it'll show you exactly how to put this terminal together. So he, he, he did that, and um, we were able to tell because I saw that he logged on, and one point, um, you, know, it, you know, he started it at 8.15 and then stopped it, and I said, I noticed that you stopped there. What was that? He was like, I had to take a bathroom break. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one, of his, uh, one of his staff, who, uh, one of the guys who was out helping him, he actually logged on and uh, was watching the video on his iPhone on the way to the site. So, of course, you know, after they got to the site, the site was in the middle of nowhere. There was no more cell connections or whatever, but uh, he got to see most of it, and we got the system up and running. And that was in a, you know, from the time that the site went down to the time that we got the equipment there, that was a 24-hour period of getting, a, you know, a site back up like that. Nice. So, so between SLAs... Um, and I don't think we can fully eliminate, although I, I hear a lot of people would like to, fully eliminate, you know, that human touch, you know, either, either you know, back here, you know, at the, at the rack, you know, voicing what's going on, you know, to see and, and help direct the team out in the field. Um, but so we can't get rid of, you know, the staff or, or effectually reduce the staff. But would, would you all agree that it's more about training the staff to have that life cycle support, to have that understanding, to become the expert, uh, to train the trainer, and then, then you know, teach that all throughout to have that certification? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I think that's, uh, I think that's num I think for most people, uh, you, you're never going to be able to, hey, let's face it, you know, as much as we'd like to outsource everything, you, you can't, you know. Right. You have to have some staff on hand who really understand not only your technology, but your business. And, you know, that's important. You know, I mean, they have to understand that it's not just a matter of getting this site back up and running. It's there's customers who are angry right now because the site is down, right? And how do you take that, how do you take that, uh, which is, a potentially very bad feeling and turn it into a positive. Well, you turn that around by you getting to it quickly, getting the guy, you know, everybody knows what they're doing and addressing the problem quickly and getting it taken care of uh, without too much drama. And I, I think that you can actually turn a negative situation like that into a positive if you make that transition uh, as clean and smooth as possible. Mm -hmm. So, Good comment. I think one of the other th things that you need to keep looking at is, and, and we're going through that evaluation as a company, is we, we've had a, a group of people inside who really really believed in building everything on our own, especially writing our own software for all of our different components. And, and certainly when you operate networks that use a lot of your own software, there's huge amounts of additional support that are required, and you don't have a third party to fall back on when you have those issues. And, and we're going through a, you know, we built our own distribution platform, we built our own encoders, we built our own uh, middleware environment, we built our own asset management system. And so I, I think as, as things can, and, and it was easy to build an encoder for, for a while because it only had to do a certain thing. But now, now you look at an encoder and it's got to be able to flex out BOD files to the cloud uh, when capacity keeps growing. It's got to be able to, to synchronize across all of these different bit rates. It's got to be able to package not, not just package and smooth streaming, but just in time package and smooth streaming. It, it, each one of these technologies continues to advance so rapidly that, that you look at, at you know, how do you keep it all under control? You, you really have to make um, incredibly uh, decisive decisions. Where is your core strategy? Where does it make sense for you to be developing your own technology? And, and where do you then outsource those other components? So, for example, we're moving to Aspera as a distribution platform as opposed to a lot of the internally developed tools that we had, we're, we're moving to elemental encoders instead of our own encoding platform. We're just, we're just making those decisions, which has, has huge impacts to support. Uh, again, because you've got, you've got them watching it, you've got them making, so, you know, those third parties making software updates, uh, managing and, and monitoring our software and, and platforms in addition to us. And I, it is a, a, a key decision. You really have to, to think about, is it worth me building this and saving that little bit up front as opposed to, to getting it from a third party and having them to support you for the ongoing operation. Interesting. Well, and with that, let me, let me throw this back to Jim. Uh, you know, uh, within the operations, where do you see your, your biggest area of focus and why as it relates to looking at real-time situational awareness, you know, for uh, discrepancies or things of the like? And what do you see, you know, if you could look in your crystal ball, 
what would you see in the near future of things to come or that you would like to see come? So that's a good question. I, I assume that, you know, we're talking about from a distribution perspective, um, you know, all the different areas that we need to monitor and we need to control in order to get our content from point A to point B, whether it's linear or VOD or internet content. Um, and we're dealing across, you know, where, where it was up to satellite and down to the receiver. Now we're handing off internally the encoded files to maybe a third party that's you know, a third party product inside that's doing the packaging over to an origin server that we're hosting over to terrestrial circuits that might be level three or whoever, then over to Akamai or Limelight or any of the other CDN um, uh, folks, and then ultimately to your ISP and, and out. So we have, you know, you have all, all these different points that you not only have to monitor, but you have to develop relationships with the key technical people within them to be able to get fast response. So trying to do SLAs across, you know, what we might get with Akamai as opposed to level three, as opposed to, you know, uh, whoever's doing the packaging is very difficult, uh, you know, to maintain, you know, even, even a four nines or three nines product delivery at the end. Whereas before it was, okay, you know, we had Globecom signals going up, we got an SLA there, you're delivering it, satellite goes, you know, got the satellite manufacturer and then we have a receiver. There's not too many pieces of the puzzle there. Here, you know, my, my opinion is you got a very fragile infrastructure to deliver some very critical services. And the, um, as Jeremy was saying, the technology is changing so quickly that you never have a chance to implement, you know, tools and, and train the people um, to be experts to, to do that. You know, we've had a long time on the broadcast side and satellite delivery to, to build that expertise, the, the, the technicians, the engineers. These guys know what they're doing and they could, you know, they could do it with their eyes closed. Today, you know, what you might be doing on iOS uh, file delivery, in six months from now, you could be doing something completely different using different infrastructure components requiring different monitoring, um, adaptive bit rate, you know, technologies are changing. So it's, it's, it's a real challenge trying to stay current and, and also have your vendors give you back the service that you need. Um, but I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I certainly rattled on a little bit there. <laughs> well, let's, let's go to the second part real quickly. I knew there was a catch. <laughs> I'm going to hold you to point on this one. <laughs> you remember the second part, right? The, uh, no, no. Looking into the future, yeah. where do you see this going? Or is it going? And, and uh, you know, and, and back to, like, you know, your, your service providers. That, that's a great question because I, I don't see us maintaining the level or the rate of change that we have going on right now. If you look, you know, look back a couple of years, and all the technology changes and devices that have come out and, and how we have to deliver our product, we can't keep up efficiently. You know, it's, it's driving up costs, mm -hmm. as everybody knows. You need more people, um, you know, to deal with these different technologies. Somewhere, something has to change. And, you know, for a while it was like MPEG Dash. Oh, maybe, maybe Dash will be the, you know, the, the saving technology that's going to unify everything. I don't think so. Um, you know, that's just, that's not going to happen the way that I think everybody would hope it would. So, so here you are, you're going to be delivering things more than once in multiple bit rates and multiple flavors of it. Very, very inefficient way to do it, to deal with it. So what we're starting to see more, and Jeremy alluded to it, is more of the uh, MVPDs and, dis and distributors that we deliver to take delivery of mezzanine level uh, content, um, linear feeds, and having them do processing at their level, rather than us trying to do it and then deliver it out. So, you know, if Comcast wants it this way and, you know, DirecTV wants it this way and we have to maintain, you know, 10 different formats, um, you know, of, or, or variations of cable lab or whatever, you know, whatever it is, everybody gets the same MES file, everybody gets the same master metadata file. Here, guys. You guys style it the way that you need it, um, and I think that's that's where Ubiquity comes in. Is 
you know, we can go to them and deliver a MES file to them and metadata file, and then they can, you know, for their customers who are ultimately our customers too, um, you know, they can style it, and it takes the load off of us, and we can concentrate more on where we need to be. So I think you're starting to see some of the changes. Um, it's, a, it's slow, it's very costly for the MVPDs and distributors to implement this technology, as you, as you guys know. They have some complex networks, a lot of legacy equipment out there. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think that's the way it's going to go. Mm -hmm. It's going gonna, it's gonna to trickle on closer down to the edge rather than the program providers having to do more of the heavy lifting upstream. Interesting. Thanks. And, Jerry, let's take that forward with you. You know, you, talking about an, a, a true ubiquitous platform, you know. Very nice. <laughs> Our marketing department would be happy. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> I play it now. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, looking at, you know, is there a single solution? And, and you know, in the second part of that, where do you, you know, with Ubiquity, see, you know, look in your crystal ball, if you will, um, sure. and give me, you know, your, your view shot, you know, from, you know, 10,000 feet, you know, 8, 10, 12 months. Because as you know, technology, like what Jim just alluded to, technology, it's, it's at a rapid pace of change. Yeah, I, I was sitting at a user group meeting about two weeks ago, and the, um, most of the engineers in the room, they went around and asked one of them, you know, what, what do you hope happens in the industry? And... Uh, nine out of ten of them kept saying standardization, standardization, we hope it gets there, we hope there's one platform. And I said, absolutely not. Um, be because my, you know, our, our value is sitting in the middle. So the, the more complexity there is and the more that everybody wants something different, the, the more room that somebody like us has to play and, and you know, a company like Lobecom as well. Um, you know, I, I think it leads back to the comment I was making about software development in terms of what is your core competence. Um, you know, from a content provider perspective and from an MVPD perspective, they're going through those same decisions. Are, are they a content factory? Do they need to be in the business of creating the content and distributing it in every single format? Or are they a content company and, and they get it to a, a final format, whatever that high res quality is, and then there's other companies that play the middleman that, that get it into the formats that, you know, for the smaller guys who, who can't format it on their own, you know, we can go directly to those formats for guys that want to build their own content factories, we can help get it into MES and, and distribute it into those environments. We, we've seen people like DirecTV, who, who a lot of these MVPDs who have started in, in the space and kept pushing back on content providers saying, give me MES, give me MES, I want to do everything on my own. All of a sudden people started saying, yes, the floodgates open, and they said, oh, oh my god, I can't do this, i got to outsource it. You know, same thing on the content providers. Like, we want to do it on our own, we want to distribute to everybody, we, we, can, we can get rid of the middleman. And, and then, you know, again, the floodgates open and everybody comes in and they say, oh, well, I want this unique you know, Comcast right now. They, they don't want a, a master metadata file. They want three metadata files. And then they want a manifest that links together the manifest files. By the way, we can do that if you want. Um, <laughs> but uh, but, but each, each one of these guys has those unique environments. And I, I, I do think there's a, a core role for technology services companies to kind of play that middleman and, and help connect the dots to, to take that off of those companies that, that focus on their, their core business. And whether that's an MVPD have owning last mile networks and marketing content or um, there's, there's well, complexity is good. Complexity <laughs> is great. <laughs> Jim wants it simplified. Yeah. I wanna you know I, I want to simplify, you know and you bring up a good point is do the content providers focus more on developing the content and creating, you know, and, and distributing it once and let the experts transform it like you guys and deliver it down there. You, you do so, and this is something we wrestle with all the time, is you do so as long as it doesn't impact your business agility. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be able to react quickly to different business models. And if we need to change this to be able to deliver, you know, the 2.2 the or, or the 5.6 megabit you know, HD file for XYZ because it's strategic to us and we come back to you or somebody else and say, yeah, well, six months we'll be able to do that, don't worry. That doesn't work, right? So, so that's why it's a fine line between what we retain in-house and, and what we sub out. And, and I don't think we've really made, you know, we've made a very clear distinction yet as to what it is that we want to own and what we don't want to own. Um, clearly, our relationship with Globecom, we decided that, you know, we're not, uh, you know, we're not uplinkers. We don't want to put dishes in. That's not our strength. Why, you know, why should we do that? And we have a very good relationship with Globecom, and they do that, and knock on wood, it's like, you know, it's like it's in-house to us. 
Um, but we do maintain the playback in the orig origination side of it because we think that's strategic to us to be able to handle programming changes and format changes and you know things the way that we need to that make sense strategically. That part we won't give up, but you know we found we found that solution there. On on the newer technologies where we you know create you know 200 different versions of the same file to get it out there because <laughs> we have to. I'm I'm not sure that's something that we're, we're in it for the long haul of doing it ourselves. But right now it was important for us you know to be able to get out there and get our product out there. And I think uh, I think it was the right decision. So excellent. Can I well, ask one question, Jeff? Well, you talked about QoS right before, and that the newer technologies and the newer distribution paths are, are not at the same level. Is there a push or drive, do you believe, the QoS for the new technologies would be driven to the same levels as the old technologies? I, I, I don't really see a clear effort on that yet. Um, I think that's kind of a hole. I think you see people like Akamai and some of the others that are you know, I think Akamai does a very good job at defining QoS layers um, for the product that you have, and, and you can tweak it how you need it. But now, if that's going to hand off to some other distribution component, and they don't have any control down there, you, the whole thing just fell apart. So I don't, I don't really see it throughout the whole chain yet, and I don't see a, a drive, a strong drive to make that happen. Um, you know, again, on the broadcast side of things, it's a little bit different. I think people get it. And we've been in it for long enough that you know the satellite providers get it, the receiver manufacturers, you know, and, and encoders get it. This is kind of you know different beast that we're getting into, and not yet. Good question, Brian. Let me open it up to um, our, our audience here. Um, any questions, thoughts, comments? Okay, keep thinking of one because let me uh, get back to Luke here. And um, you know, from the in-field perspective, that's that's a whole different set of logistics circumstances. You know, uh, how do you see this evolving, if at all? You know, and I'm going back to the look in your crystal ball and give me your snapshot. I, I think there's going to be more. Um, I think there's going to have to be some more intelligent MNC systems. Uh, it's not just uh, telling you what the alarm is, but how to fix it. Um, and I think that, you know, so for network operations people and, uh, you know, in-house support people, they're going to need to know exactly what to do. This device turned red, and what do I do when that happens? Now, as Jim said, there's a lot of training that goes with that, and it almost becomes second nature for someone to react to that alarm. But when you talk about now uh, having to get somebody out into the field, uh, and like I said, there's so many different technologies and the way that, you know, you guys are talking about it more better than I can. But like, you know, as an example, uh, yesterday morning, uh, my daughter's 20 years old and uh, I heard her cracking up. She's sitting on the couch laughing. And I'm like, what is she laughing at, you know? And, and I looked over and I saw her on her phone. And I was like, what are you looking at? I'm just watching this video. I, that's how the younger generation is going to be viewing this stuff on the iPad, on the iPhone, on these mobile devices. And, you know, how it gets, I mean, like, like Jim brought up a great point, like, how do you troubleshoot something like that? You, you almost, you, you can't, you know? There are just too many, uh, yeah. too many uh, people in, in the chain. The ISP itself, you know, the, for God's sakes, the wireless router in the person's home, right? So, um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of challenges. Uh, how, what the crystal ball is going to be is I, I think everything's going to change. And it may happen slower, you know, sure. for, for the people who are actually providing the content and trying to get it out there. But for the, for the young people who are actually, you know, looking at these devices and stuff, they're going to change regardless of what we do. So yeah. they're going to be the game changers. They're going to be the game changers, yeah. yeah. And then we and, have to keep up. Yeah. I mean, for, but as, as far as supporting those, uh, those networks, for a field guy, it's going to be the same. He's going to have to go in there. He's going to have to figure it out. It's troubleshooting 101, you know. Um, so whether the device is a, uh, you know, uh, some, whether it's delivered by a satellite or, or via a terrestrial network, it doesn't matter. He's going to have to figure it out. Right. Um, but again, like I said, I think a lot of that might tie back to somebody in the, at the hub telling him, okay, here's what you do, you know. Okay, good, thanks. Any last question from anybody? Okay, well, let's, let's just come down the 
down the row here. And um, thanks, everybody, for your participation. Appreciate it. Just some closing comments. You know, what can we leave talk, uh, our audience with as it relates to, um, you know, the, the importance of you know, managing this type of infrastructure and what should, you know, give them, if you can, think about two critical points they, they should focus on. That's the uh, second 64, <laughs> that's the second $64 million question. And see, for those of you that have stayed throughout, this is that extra bonus. Yeah. Um, I, I've got like little USB hard drives outside for anybody who wants them afterwards. That's fine. Um, plug them into your system, back it up, you'll be good to go. Um, I, again, I, I think what we've done is really try to analyze from a business perspective. You can't monitor everything. What, what is it? Where, where is it really most important in your in the processing to monitor? Where, where is it? Humans that are. I got humans that are, are doing QC and actually looking at the content. Where can you build it automated? Where, you know, at what level are you, do you have to do the monitoring and all, all of, of those points? And then how do you have a single centralized system that at least is catching all of those alerts and being able to then create trouble tickets and route them within your organization? I think thinking that through system by system is is really often overlooked. People are, rush too much to just go build the platform as opposed to looking through that piece of it and. Uh, the more you do that up front, uh, the better off you're going to be. And, and not kidding, there's brochures, and I have some USB sticks out there if anyone wants them. Thanks, Jeremy. Luke? Uh, I, think, I think we touched on some pretty good subjects here, but I think you know, part of it is, like Jeremy said, uh, combining all of those things together. Uh, of course, intelligent M&C systems. Uh, it, you know, it's not just so much you know, devices are go almost going to have to fix themselves. Um, it's not good enough anymore to just have an alarm. Uh, the device has to know to do something when that alarm happens, right? Um, because, you know, you can't have somebody monitoring everything. Sure. We're, we're all, we all kind of agree on that. Um, as far as, like, life cycle support in the field goes, I think, you know, again, there's going to be a, 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 you know, there's going to be a shift in uh, technology, that, and, and people tend to adapt to that shift, just like young people do with the way they're watching uh, content now. Um, I think the you know the you know the the folks that don't change will be left behind. The folks that do change will be successful. Good points. Good points. Lastly, so you know I, I think what you know what we're seeing from a content provider standpoint is it's getting more difficult to predict what device you're going to be delivering to. Um, each device that comes out it might have different delivery requirements, different you know formats of video, high def, standard def, sub you know, sub whatever, um, and it's knowing and and creating the content in a way that's going to be optimized for that device. Like for instance, I don't really have a need to deliver a high def picture to you know to a BlackBerry or deliver anything to a BlackBerry, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but to a tablet, you know, I want my content to look the best on this tablet. So us as content providers, we have to know what, you know, what are all the technical aspects of this device and what can it be used for? For instance, um, you know, people with iOS devices, iPhones and, every, and tablets, you know, a lot of them connect them to their TVs. So what might be good for delivering on this screen here maybe a standard definition picture once you plug that into a you know 60 inch tv doesn't really look that good um and then you got to protect in our case we have to protect the content so for you know i think looking forward is you know we have to really take a step back and look at what are going to be the other devices that are going to be coming out the gaming consoles the tvs the connected tvs what are going to be the capabilities for them and, and really look at our networks and, and the process that we have um, so that we can create the content for that specific platform. It's, it's a big challenge, um, but we're moving in the right direction. Great. Thank you again, everyone, for... Okay. <laughs>